maybe you're going to struggle every single day of your life um, with the situation that you have. Uh, maybe you wouldn't yell at your kids, but do you gossip with all the girls? Okay. Maybe you wouldn't wear those things. Okay. But it's so true. It's like, what do people say about Christians? You're so judgmental. As we progress in our relationship with Christ, our lives will change. And now, instead of judging when you believe the Bible and the Bible alone, I said, that's what we live for is just this one. All right, good morning. Good morning. For those of you that are in Phoenix, we are super glad you're here today joining us for our Truth Matters series. For those of you that are watching us online, apps, Roku, YouTube, any way you found us, we are super glad you're joining us. Also, if you want to know more about our ministry, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. There, you can normally get handouts for lessons, but there is no handouts today, so you can catch up on all of our past lessons. We have guest speakers every so often, today being one of them. So today we are continuing on with our Truth Matters series, and we want to talk about why truth matters in regards to Islam. Now here is the premise to our series. There has to be one truth in this world. There just has to be. It's not like you have your own truth and I have my own truth and it's just, we just all have our own truth. It's like somewhere there has to be this, this baseline for truth. When we had Josh McDowell here, he, he gave this really great um, definition of truth and he said, truth is something that is the same as the original. And that's how you know. So for us, we know that the Bible has to be our final authority. It has to be the final truth. Everything that the Bible says, because it's given us where we came from, how we were created, why the world is in a mess with sin, what God did for us by sending Jesus to die on a cross, to rise from the dead so that he can reconcile us to him. So all of those things happen. We know that. So, there, so the, the baseline for truth would be what the Bible has to say. Now, Jesus says this in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We live in a world where people want to join this religion, and, and I just am a good person, and, and we have all these other ways of getting to God, and yet they're ways that are untruth ways. And so that's why we're doing this series. And um, I, I realize that we as Christians need to know, we brought in uh, Lynn Wilder, she spoke about Mormonism. Uh, we're bringing in Davis so he can talk about Islam because we need to know what other religions believe so that we can have an answer for them, just like David had uh, when, he, uh, when he shares what he knows. David is my hero. He doesn't know that, but <laughs> and the reason for it is because most of you, we talk a lot about in here Nabil Qureshi. Nabil is the author of Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. We've talked about, a lot about him in, in Bible study. The most amazing thing about David is that, and he'll share this in his story, but, but if you look at Nabil's life and the amount of people that came to know Christ through Nabil, it all started because David Wood actually took the time to spend four years sharing the gospel with him and, and working with him. I don't have that much patience. So that's why I'm like, you don't want to come to Jesus today? Well, I'm on to the next thing. Okay, David is not like that. He studied with him and he worked with him, and so we are so excited to have David here. Please welcome Mr. Dave. So good morning. This is, uh, this is actually my first women's Bible study in my entire life. And, uh, one of the interesting things I learned from this first women's Bible study is, is how many guys come to women's Bible studies. To, that says something about the women's Bible study. If guys are like, I'm going to the women's Bible study, I don't care care about my own Bible study. I'm going to the women's Bible study. That means there, there must be some awesome, uh, awesome work going on here. Um, anyway, I'm going to uh, set this up with a, an anecdote. This was, uh, we got boy number five on the way. And uh, my second son, who's, uh, who's named Blaze, after Blaze Pascal, he, uh, he's the one who likes to read a lot. And so he would, he, he, would, he would read books as fast as I could buy them. So I would take him to Barnes and Noble, get him a stack of books. And, uh, and then he would read them, and I would tell him, whenever he's finished, uh, I'll take him back and, and get him more. So um, we used to go to Barnes & Noble once every week or every other week. And uh, this one time we go, he's, I don't know, seven years old or something at this time. And I go to stand in checkout line, and he ends up running all over the store playing tag and stuff, which, which would have been embarrassing, but I was thinking, like, well, no one knows that's my kid, right? So do whatever he wants. Um, 
but he's, he's really, I keep seeing him like just running full speed around there. And, uh, and he knows I don't like that. But then all of a sudden, I'm, I, I get up, I put the books down in front of the cashier, and I look and I see him flying towards me. He's about to run right past me. So as he's about to go right behind me, I reach back and I snatch him, right? And then I just, I, I hold him there. And then he starts doing something crazy. He starts trying to pull away from me, right? And uh, I don't know if, I don't know how parenting works out here in Arizona. Um, we're from the Bronx, so I got this special trick. You, you can wind your hand up in a kid's t-shirt, right? And then it makes it extra tight, right? You start winding your hand in it and it makes it super tight and then he can't go anywhere. So I start winding my hand up in, in, uh, in Blaze's t-shirt and other than that, other than that, I'm just acting like everything is normal with, with, the, with the cashier. I'm like, yes, I am a member. Here's my card. Doing everything one-handed, right? And all of a sudden, this woman comes up, and she comes up and leans over and starts staring at me, right? And so I look back like, go back to your PETA meeting. I don't, it's my kid. Leave me alone, right? And then, but she sits there looking, staring right in my face. And I'm like, what is wrong with this woman? So... And at first I didn't care, but then I was like, I wonder if everyone else is worried about me having my kid in this death grip right here. So I turned to the other side to look at the line, see if the people in line are looking at me. And then I look over and, and there at the end of the store, I see my son Blaze. <laughs> and then everything starts to make sense, right? <laughs> This isn't some weird woman. This I have her kid, right? Okay, now it all now it all makes sense. So, so I turned and uh, and I said, you know, it's little kid, same height as my son, same hair color, eye color, everything, perfect little match, and so on. And uh, so I, I get down with the guy, I get down with the kid, and he's terrified. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were my son. Look, there's my son. He looks exactly like you, and so on. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm so going to jail. And, uh, but the woman was nice. She she calmed her son down and stuff, and took off and. And uh, w when that was over, I realized that that was the, the exact same feeling I had when, uh, when I had become a Christian, right? That, that feeling of I was clinging so tight to something that I thought was the right thing to be clinging to. And oh my goodness, I've been clinging to the completely wrong thing. And now I'm in a lot of, a lot of trouble here. That was the feeling I had when, um, when I became a Christian. I've been an atheist for uh, for. Uh, for, for all my life. And uh, so we'll, we'll uh, talk about that for a few before we get into um, Islam. Um, my sort of path towards Christ started when I was about five years old. Um, I had a little dog since my entire time I was growing up. I had a little dog named uh, Goliath, this little raggedy mutt who would just attack anything, cars, buses, didn't matter. Um, but one day my mom gets a phone call and my mom starts crying and she turns to me with tears in her eyes and she tells me that Goliath had been run over by a bus. And I look back at her and I thought, so what, it's just a dog. And I couldn't figure out why my mom was, was crying. I mean, she hated my dog. I hated her cat, she hated my dog. But she's crying over my dog and I couldn't figure out why she would cry over a dog. Like, don't, don't you know that thing's gonna die someday? And uh, so I thought at that point that there was something wrong with my mom. And, uh, but later, as I, as I got older, um, had other friends and their, their pets would die and then they would, uh, they would all cry. And so it's like, at first it was like, whoa, this is spreading. Whatever this is, whatever this disease is, it's spreading. Everyone's crying over animals. Don't they know that there are billions of animals around the planet dying all the time? What's, what, what's wrong with these people? Um, now, I didn't find out until uh, a while later that I had the same reaction if it's, uh, if it's a human being. I was 16 years old, and my best friend um, from when I was growing up was a guy named uh, Jimmy Lindholm. And uh, he'd, all, the whole time we were growing up, he always said he wanted to go parasailing. And uh, he finally went parasailing. His harness broke, and, uh, and he died. And so I heard that. I, I walked over his house, and that's when I found that out. And I walked away. And as I was walking away, I was thinking... Wow, I really don't. I really don't care here. And at that point, it was like, well, it seems like that is a situation where you should care that someone that someone died. So at that point, I was starting to think that that there was something wrong with me. Um, I didn't find out until 
years later, after being evaluated by psychiatrists, that uh, that I have antisocial personality disorder. That's what that's what psychopaths and sociopaths have. They don't form a normal emotional attachments to other people. But you don't know that when you're young, so you have to figure it out on your own. You don't know, oh, this is a problem, that there are lots of people in the world who have this problem. Um, all you know is, hey, I react very differently to all these different situations um, that we're in. And so I had to think through that. I had to think through why, um, why I don't have these normal reactions. And I concluded at the, at the end of trying to figure this out that I had evolved to a higher stage of humanity, right? So you have, you know, animals and then human beings. And for a time, human beings need emotions for the benefit of, of the species. But now we keep evolving. And now we've reached a stage where people can just operate on pure logic and reason and not need all of these emotional uh, issues to, to hold them back. So I concluded that I'm like the, the new pinnacle of, of humanity. And when you start thinking like that, you start thinking, well, I kind of don't have to follow the, the rules that other people follow, right? Because I'm, I'm, beyond, I'm beyond those kinds of things. Why would I let other people tell me what I can and cannot do? So uh, long story short, I ended up behaving accordingly. And one night in the middle of the night, I was running from the police. I had broken into a place and stolen some stuff. And uh, I was running from the police, and they had me surrounded on three sides. So there's a hill here on one side that has a road. I'm on a set of railroad tracks, and there's the Monongahela River beside me. And so police are at the road, and they're running down the hill. And they end up getting behind me on the railroad tracks. They're in front of me on the railroad tracks, and they're beside me. So when the first police officer showed up, he, he points a uh, a flashlight on me and he'll stop. I yell no. I started running, but then they uh, they had me surrounded. So the only way out was the Monongahela River. So um, anyway, I jumped in the river and swam across and actually beat them. Uh, I beat them across. They had to go across the bridge. I swam across. So I made it across the river and started working my way up a hill on the other side, got up the other side, and uh, eventually I came out and of, of the of the patch of woods I was running through, I came out and find myself in the found myself in the back of someone's yard, and in front of me there was this this beautiful garden, and just from habit I started to walk around the garden, but then I stopped to philosophize. I thought, why am I walking around the, this person's garden? I don't care about this person. I don't care. Certainly don't care about this person's vegetables. So why am I being so courteous here. And I concluded that, well, the, the reason is that, that these people have sort of brainwashed me since birth into behaving in certain ways and to, to doing what they want me to do. So as I sort of stomped my way through that person's garden, I got this incredible rush of freedom. Like I've been forced and held down in chains and a collar or a leash all my life and that I could finally just do what I wanted. And after a while, I kept chasing that, right? It's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. Someone says, don't do something, and then you go and do it anyway, and then realize you've just sort of broken free from something that people were using to control you. But if you, it's like drugs, if you start taking drugs, then you got to keep taking more, right? And then higher doses and so on. So um, eventually uh, decided to uh, kill my dad. This is after studying bomb building and everything, thinking about all the different things I could do, and uh, eventually decided to kill my dad. So this is a women's Bible study with some young people in there. I'll leave out the horrible details. You can, uh, you can check those out on, online or you can get the police report if you want. But um, I, uh, I tried to kill my dad with a hammer. I hit him in the head seven or eight times, and I thought that this was like going to be the final the final metamorphosis, once I've stripped off every last, I mean, once you've done that, there's nothing, there's nothing left to do as far as breaking free from what people have been telling you all your life that you have to do. So uh, I uh, attacked my dad, uh, left him for dead, and got in my truck and, and drove away and felt absolutely nothing. There was no reaction. Um, but at, at this point, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a good feeling like that, that rush of freedom. It was just a dead feeling, like it, it, there's nothing that matters right now. I don't have any feeling about 
uh, anything, good or bad, just a kind of uh, numbness. So it was after that uh, I got stuck in a psychiatric hospital, and that's where um, they gave me a, a couple of diagnoses, but the, the relevant one there was um, antisocial personality disorder. And ended up uh, there for a while in the psychiatric hospital and, and then to jail where I was found guilty of malicious wounding, which is, um, well, it's what it sounds like, malicious wounding. Uh, because my dad survived, it would have been, it would have been murder, but, but he survived. They, they, um, one of his friends found him, took him to a hospital, and uh, the hospital there said he'll die here. They had a world champion neurosurgeon in another city. They took him there. Guy uh, had to patch his skull back together. And uh, so I was found guilty of malicious wounding, and I was there uh, in the jail and just did not care, right? It was, well, why, why would I ever want to follow this normal pattern that people follow where you go to school until you're 18, and then maybe you go to college, and then you get a job, and then you work at that job for 30 or 40 years, and then you retire, and then you sit around watching television. Why am I going to do that? Why, what, what's the point of doing that rather than just doing whatever you happen to feel like doing, which I can always do right here in jail. Um, so didn't really bother me that, that I was in jail. Um, and it was there in the jail that I met a Christian named Randy. Christian named Randy found out from having conversations with him that uh, Randy was in there for turning himself in for 21 felonies. He became a Christian and went and told the police everything he'd ever done. And they said, all right, we've got information for 21 felonies that we're charging you with. He was found guilty of all 21 felonies. But uh, Randy was, a, was an interesting fellow. There would be a, a fight in the dorm, the dorm that we were in, and Randy wouldn't watch the fight. He wouldn't look. So I would start going up to him, hey, hey, did you see that fight between, between Kevin and so-and-so? And he'd go, no, I turned away. I was praying that it would stop. Go, what is wrong with this guy, right? We have one form of entertainment in there, which are fights, right? And this guy's praying that our only form of entertainment stops. Something strange going on with this guy. So um, anyway, one day Randy was up on his bunk reading his Bible, which he would do a couple hours a day. He's up on his bunk reading his Bible, and I walked up to him and I said, hey, you know where you're reading the Bible? You're reading the Bible because you're born in the United States. If you've been born anywhere else, you believe in something else. If you've been born in China, you'd be a Buddhist. If you've been born in India, you'd be a Hindu. If you've been born in Saudi Arabia, you'd be a Muslim. Because people like you believe whatever you're told to believe. Now, that was interesting because uh, what did I believe? Well, I believe that the universe formed on its own and life formed on its own out in the ocean. And I believed all these things. Where I, I heard them in my high school biology class and things like that. And I just believed them and never thought, never occurred to me to really question them. Uh, so, in other words, I believed everything I was taught to believe. It's very rare to find someone who just comes up with a completely new belief that no one has ever thought of before. But I'm sitting here pointing a finger at him. You just believe what you're taught to believe, and whereas I, of course, did as well. Um, but something strange happened there. Uh, Randy actually put up a fight, and I had never seen that before. Every Christian I'd ever messed with or tried to start an argument with or told him he was stupid, they would always, they could kind of tell I was about, I was just going to go full force argument. And they would, hey, I, you know, hey, we don't want to cause a scene here. I don't want to cause a scene here. So, you know, I'll just, I'll just pray for you, brother. That sort of situation, right? And Randy, he just starts challenging everything I say. And that is an annoying habit. You start questioning everything someone says. And that is, by the way, that is a good habit to get into. I, 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 would, I would make some claim, oh, come on, all scientists say, really, all scientists? You know what all scientists say on this? I had no clue what I was talking about. I was just taking what I believe and then saying all scientists agree with me, right? But he, he, he kept doing that. I would say, oh, I would make some claim about Jesus or about the universe or about life. And he would just, oh, where, where'd you get that? I'm thinking, I, I, don't, I have no idea where I got that from. Maybe I heard it. Maybe I saw it on TV. Maybe I thought it up myself. I don't know, right? Um, but anyway, he was making, he was making me a uh, making me very uncomfortable by challenging all these beliefs that I'd held as obviously certain. And then just by asking me some simple questions, I start realizing very quickly that I have no clue what I'm talking about on a lot of these issues. 
still believed I was right, but I, I realized a lot of what I believe, I just, I have no idea where I got that. And so uh, found out after several attempts to argue with Randy, and this is a guy, he did not, he was not some world champion scholar or anything like that. So it wasn't, uh, he didn't just happen to know much more than me. He was just good at getting me to realize that I didn't know much about what I was talking about. And so I kept trying to argue with him and he kept defeating me, which is weird, right? Because why? Keep in mind, I'm the pinnacle of humanity, remember? Everyone else is inferior to me, especially some Christian in a jail who's so incredibly dumb that he turned himself in for a bunch of crimes and won't watch fights. This is the last person in the world who should be winning an argument against D. Wood here. Couldn't beat him in arguments. I realized that after many exchanges. So I, I started trying to beat him in, in other ways. I would, I can't repeat a lot of the things I would say, because if you see someone's weakness, then you can say something and you can start trying to, trying to go after their weakness. I saw him in the, in, the, in the visitation room one day with his sister. He had a 12 year old sister. So started saying things about his sister and finally got him upset and he yelled at me. And I go, look at you, yelling at me. You call yourself a Christian, right? And uh, so, but I, I would find his weaknesses as we went on and I would uh, attack him there. I told everyone he's gay and things like that. And uh, I kept trying to beat him that way. And eventually I, I found out how I could beat him at something. Randy would fast for long periods of time. Uh, I'd never seen someone fast seven days on nothing but water before. I would talk to him and ask him why. And he would say, well, you know, once I get released, I'm not going to have the opportunity to do long period fasting. You can't do that while you're, you know, you have a job and stuff. So here I'm going to use this time to do long term fasting because it's the only time I'll ever be able to do this sort of thing. So Randy went seven days on nothing but water. I know because he gave me all his meals. And after a while, I thought I'm going to go 10. My first fat. Now you're looking at me now and you're thinking, David, you've obviously never fasted a day in your life. Uh, no, this is, that's now. This is back then. My first fast, the first time I ever fasted, I went 10 days on nothing but water. And I was messed up. I was like falling over and stuff. And, um, but I did it. I did it just to beat the Christian. And so we, we'd go back and forth. We'd go back and forth. He'd fast and then I'd fast and he'd fast and I'd fast. And he asked me, he goes, David, how come every time I fast, you fast like two or three days longer? I'm like, I don't know. It's just a coincidence, man. Eventually, Randy went 40 days told me that Jesus had done it. He went, he went, to be clear, he went 32 days on nothing but water. And then for the rest, for the, for the, for the rest of the time, he, he drank Kool-Aid to sort of prepare his body for food again. Uh, but then again, there again, he gave me all his trays. So he had water for 32 days and then Kool-Aid and then did that for 40 days. And I said, all right, going 42. Beat you and Jesus. So it was on the 11th day when I passed out and busted my head and they stuck me in a, a camera cell. They thought I was trying to kill myself, right? They, they saw I have, I, I'd been to two mental hospitals and they, they, they thought I'm trying to starve myself. I'm trying to beat the Christian. They think I'm trying to murder myself in a really, really slow, silly way. So they stick me in a camera cell where I have a camera watching me in the entire time so that, uh, so that, so they can make sure I don't, you know, hang myself or something like that. Back there in the camera cell, I thought, you know, this is a perfect opportunity. The only reason Randy has been beating me in these discussions is that he just happens to know a lot more than I do about the Bible and so on. So I'm back here, I'm gonna study, I'm gonna learn all new arguments, and then once they put me back in there, then I can crush him and he'll see that I'm right and he's wrong. So I got these, I got Bible studies from the chaplain and so on, got a, a had a Gideon's Bible and then stacks of Bible studies from the chaplain, and I, uh, I start reading. I had read uh, Matthew and, and Mark before then, uh, but the Bible series was on the Gospel of John. And uh, so I start going through, I start going through this series, and I, I continue fasting back there, and I get really, really sort of pathetic looking. Um, if you're looking at me now, I'm about 250 pounds. I got down to 150 there, uh, there in the jail, and, and 150 is Perfectly good weight for, for most people. If you're if you're six foot three, you're looking pretty, pretty uh, pretty pretty sad there. Skin turned yellow. Got this rash all over my body. It was a uh, it was pretty horrible. But I'm back there. I'm back there. The one thing that keeps me going is I got to beat this Christian, right? Got to learn this stuff. I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there, and I got that I got that Gideon's Bible, and I wrote all over it. I am the master of my life. I don't need blah blah blah. And uh, 
sitting there reading, going through the Bible studies, and then uh, it started feeling like that the Bible was mocking me, right? Because something would happen, and then I would read a I would read a Bible verse, and it would uh, it would seem to connect. Like I was uh, I started getting tunnel vision, where I would only see like this much, and for some reason I, I have no basis for thinking this, but I thought that that tunnel was going to get smaller and smaller until it was just dark, and that's when I was going to die, right? Um, so I'd be thinking something like this, and then I would do my my Bible lesson for the day. These were graded. You had to send them and send them out, and then people grade them and then send them back to you and so on. I was acing everything. But uh, sitting there doing this Bible study, and I'm, I'm thinking, wow, once that once that tunnel vision gets down to nothing, that's when I that's when uh, I die. And then I would read, I am the resurrection and the life. He who comes to me will live even though he dies. And you don't know what you're talking about. What you're talking about, Jesus? Or I'd be thinking, you know, it's kind of funny. These guys bring me three meals a day, and I'm starving. I'm actually, I'm, I'm starving to death back here. And these guys bring me food every day. And then I would read, I am the bread of life. You comes to me, will never go hungry. Huh. Making stuff up now, right? So I kept reading and so on, and eventually uh, three things started, started bothering me as I was going through these. Um, going through the Bible studies and then just thinking about things. One, one I was just uh, one day I was just lying on my back and I was too tired to do anything and I was looking at the wall. I was looking at the the bricks that are arranged in the cell, and I thought, you know, someone told me that these bricks went into this order by chance or erosion or something like that. I would think that it's the stupidest thing I'd ever heard in my entire life, and yet I believe that life formed just by a bunch of random things coming together, when life is vastly, vastly more complicated than a bunch of bricks stacked on top of each other. Why would I think it's completely idiotic to say it about the wall, but I won't even question whether that's what happened with life. And so this didn't convince me that, that God existed, but it took me back to that, maybe I haven't thought through these things enough, and maybe this is that things are actually pointing in a different direction. That was the first thing that started bothering me. Uh, the next thing was uh, was the resurrection. I had always believed that I had an explanation for the origin of Christianity. Disciples went out preaching that Jesus uh, rose from the dead. Why did they go around preaching that? Well, it's actually very simple. Um, Jesus died. His followers wanted to keep the message going. If you really want to keep your message going, make up a story about your guy rising from the dead. Then that's going to convince more people that they need to pay attention to him. Brilliant plan, and it worked. We see how Christianity has spread all over the world. They came up with a plan, and it worked. And I found out from Randy, and then from, from reading more, that Jesus' apostles died in some horrible, awful ways. These guys went to some horrible, bloody deaths, proclaiming that Jesus is the risen Lord who had appeared to them. And I sat there, and I tried to think of anyone in all of history who had died for something that he had made up. And I couldn't think of one person. Lots of people die for something that's a lie. When terrorists crash planes into buildings, they're dying for something that's not true. But when a terrorist crashes a plane into a building, that tells me he really believes what, what he's dying for. He really believes it. He's not making this up. He's taking this very, very seriously. And so that showed me that the disciples really believed what they were dying for and therefore, they weren't willingly making it up. So how else can I go on to explain this? Because notice the difference. Uh, whether a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew or a Republican or a Democrat or whatever, when someone dies for what they believe in, and you ask, why did they believe that? Well, it's they heard some message from someone else, and they agreed with it, and they agreed with it so much that they're willing to die for it. That happens. The disciples weren't dying for something that they heard from someone else that they believed with such confidence that they were willing to die for it. They were dying for something they said they saw. And so that left me with a little puzzle. What could convince all these guys that they had all seen a man risen from the dead and appearing to them? What could account for that? And I couldn't think of anything other than Jesus actually appearing to them. So there was that problem. And the final thing that started bothering me is you read about Jesus and Jesus is pretty cool guy. Right? And uh, I couldn't help but admiring him and how he would handle certain situations in the Gospels as I was reading about him. Now, why is that a problem? Well, if I believe that I'm the pinnacle of humanity, and this guy really seems cooler than I am, then I've got to, that, that sort of undermines my entire belief about, about myself. But uh, I, I eventually ended up with a kind of dilemma 
because I held two beliefs simultaneously which, which did not fit together. One is that everything is ultimately meaningless. We're insignificant. You've got this entire universe and our galaxy is just this pathetic little speck and our planet is an even uh, more pathetic speck. And then we're these little blobs of cells crawling around on this little speck of dust thinking that what we do is so important. It's all meaningless. Eventually we're all going to die. The universe is going to die a heat death. None of it really matters. Nothing we really do. If, if you spend all your life killing people, that's not much different from spending all your life helping people. It doesn't make any difference in the long run. So there is no real right and wrong. It's just the way things seem to us. I believed that. I believed that from the time I was a teenager on. But I also believed I'm the greatest, most important human being who's ever lived. Now, what sense does it make to say, to believe I'm the greatest, most important, completely meaningless sack of cells crawling around on this pathetic, insignificant piece of dust? It doesn't. You gotta drop one of those. If the universe is really meaningless, then I am no more important than anything else. And if I am more important than everything else, then there's some sort of standard here of what is really great. There's some sort of standard. If there's a standard, I'm in trouble because if there's really a standard of right and wrong, what business do I have thinking that I'm the top of it and not, not someone like Jesus? So my uh, moral foundations came crumbling to the ground and I was sitting back there in the cell thinking about all of this and by the time I'd gotten down to 150 pounds and skin had turned yellow and couldn't stand up without falling over and so on, I was just thinking, you know, I got into a fight. I mean, I got in a lot of fights, but there was this one particular fight I was thinking of where I got into a fight with, with seven guys. I'm not saying that to sound tough. They, they, they got me on the ground, took turns soccer kicking my head for a while. I got one of them. got one of them at the beginning, and then all his buddies got me way worse. Anyways, I had a flashback to that fight, and I was thinking, you know, that time those guys held me on the ground and kicked me in the head over and over again, that was really bad, but went to the hospital afterwards, they put my arm in a sling, I had some scratches, I had a headache, but I was fine the next day. I thought, this right here, this is not going away. This is way worse. This is way worse right now. What, 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 what I'm going through in this cell is way worse than just you know, getting stomped into the ground by a bunch of guys. This, is, this feels like I've been stomped into the ground by like a size infinity boot. And right when I thought that, I had another flashback to walking home from my friend Steve's about year or two earlier, and I got, was walking home and everything is nice and calm, and all of a sudden, it's a massive thunderstorm, Lightnings, lightning bolts are going all around me and so on, and just not even taking anything seriously, I looked up and I go, come on, if you want me to believe in you, you're going to have to come down here and beat me into the ground and make me believe, and I just, I just kept walking, and, but I was remembering that, wait a minute, I told God, he's going to have to beat me into the ground and make me believe in him, and I just thought to myself, it feels like I've been stomped into the ground by a size infinity boot. That didn't convince me, but that got me, that got me really thinking. And then it just in the course of assessing my situation, the situation I was in, I went from thinking that I was the best person in the world to thinking I was the worst person in the world, right? I mean, I'm sitting in here starving to death. I'm covered in a rash. I fall over if I get up. I'm in here for trying to bludgeon my dad to death. All, I sit around here thinking about all the people I'm going to torture if I ever get a chance. It's not the, I mean, there are people who have problems in various ways, but I'm like the mother load of awful, horrible problems here. And so I went from thinking that I was the best person in the world to thinking I was the worst person in the world. And that's a, that can actually be a very good thing. Because if you, if you think you're the best person in the world, well, there's not much that can shake your spirit. If you think that you're the worst person in the world, then you start thinking, there are two possibilities here. Either I'm the worst person in the world and I'm stuck like this and this is just the way things are and I'm a horrible, horrible person and I've ruined my life and that's all there is. Or you think, maybe there's someone out there who helps people like me. And once you start thinking like that, I'd say you're about an inch away from becoming a Christian because you can look all the way down through history. And when you look and ask who out of anyone ever who had a reputation for being able to take emotionally and spiritually and psychologically and physically shattered people and give them new life? You get a list of one. There was only one person on that list, and it ain't Muhammad, it ain't Buddha, it's none of those guys. 
You get a list of one, that's Jesus. And so at that point, I wasn't convinced yet, but I was to the point where, what else, what have I got to lose here? What if I bow down and pray and nothing happens? Well, it's not like I'm going to be worse off, right? It's not going to make me worse already as, as bad as I can be. So after thinking through this for a while, what have I got to lose? I bowed down and I prayed. And I said, God, I don't know if I'm going to believe in you tomorrow, but I'll believe in you right now. And if you can do anything with me, you're welcome to it. And then just based on the Bible studies and the memory verses and so on, they did a kind of sinner's prayer that, that they give you. And uh, remember, I sat up. I sat up from that prayer. And everything had somehow changed colors. Like I was seeing everything in some colors that I had never seen before. And some people describe a, like a weight being lifted off them and so on. First of all, don't base, don't base your your faith on feelings. They, feelings can lead you astray. But people want to know what I felt, and so I, I, I tell them. But uh, I had a slightly different feeling. I felt like I had been uh, fighting. And I don't mean figuratively fighting. I mean, I felt like I had been physically in a gladiator ring for the past 20 years of my life, so much so that I didn't know any other existence and didn't even know what was going on. And that after 20 years of nonstop, endless physical fighting, all of a sudden, everything just goes quiet and stops, and I can sit down. And that's what it felt like. So, whoa, everything just got calm. And so um, that, was, uh, that was about a year into my sentence. I had many more years to serve in, uh, in, uh, in prison and spent a lot of that time studying the Bible and eventually studying apologetics. I didn't know what apologetics was back then. It was actually an old man in the jail came up to me with Josh McDowell's More Than a Carpenter. And he comes up to me and he goes, my daughter sent me this. Seems like something you'd be more interested in. And uh, so he gave me more than a carpenter. And that's the first time I was reading apologetics, realizing that it was apologetics. I had read some apologetics before, but I didn't know what apologetics was. I just thought I was reading books about Christianity. Uh, so um, started uh, studying, studying apologetics there. And um, for a long time, I still thought of myself as like worst person in the world. In fact, uh, uh, one, one, but right before I... Uh, uh, a little, several months before I became a Christian, I was in uh, a psychiatric hospital and they had me there for a few weeks and I was just babbling on one day and uh, one of the administrators there goes, if you actually think like that, then they have got you in the right place here. So that's not a great, that's not very encouraging, but that's what he, that's what he said to me. So fast forward a few years to where I still think I'm, I'm like that. That's in my, that's ingrained in my brain now that I'm like, awful, horrible person who just happens to have been saved by grace. And one day, there, there was this uh, guy, his name was, he was in the dorm, his name was Floyd Walls. He's sweeping, and I'm walking, and, and walking by him, and he goes, uh, he goes, Wood, I don't, I don't mean to pry into your business, but some of us are wondering what you did to get in here. And so we're thinking, like maybe you were walking down the street and had your girlfriend there, and someone disrespected her or pushed her, you punched him to defend her, and then you got locked up for it. That's the only way we can see someone like you getting locked up in a place like this. And all of a sudden I was thinking, wait, you think I'm good? You guys think, <laughs> you guys think I'm, I'm a good guy now? Like you guys, wait a minute. This was very confusing to me, right? Like you guys think that the only way I could end up in prison is if I was defending a woman's honor? And so that's when I kind of, oh, I guess I've been changing and not, and not really realizing it along the way. And so that's the, that's, the, that, that, that's the impact of just spending, spending a lot of time uh, in the Bible was, was having on me over the years. And I didn't, I didn't realize it until people started bringing these kinds of things up. So it uh, wasn't uh, long after that that I was released and um, went off. Went, I had filled out the paperwork to go to school before I, before I got out. Uh, went to Old Dominion University. And uh, just to bring it up to where you guys have, have been there, I wanted to learn to debate in case uh, it was ever helpful for apologetics. And so got on the speech and debate team and went on a, a trip once because you'd go to other schools to compete. And went away to another school and had to share a hotel room with another guy on the team. And uh, I thought it was cool because he had a Muslim name, named Nabil Qureshi. I was thinking, 
well, it doesn't tell you much, right? Could be totally liberal, um, could be very conservative, have no idea just based on his name. But we go up into the room and uh, I put my stuff away and then I'm sitting down on the bed and I'm, I'm, reading my, uh, I'm reading my Bible in a year. I was in Isaiah at that point and I seem to be putting away his prayer rug. I was thinking, oh, well, he's at least devout enough that he brings a prayer rug on a school trip for, for a weekend. So he's at least that devout. Then I'm sitting there and in prison I had had tons of very interesting interactions with uh, Muslim friends. So I had uh, I'd studied a little bit um, in prison. Those didn't always end well because like, like one of the main guys that I would have discussions with was my weightlifting partner and he was, he was the imam there in, uh, in the prison. And so we would be arguing Christianity and Islam and lifting weights and it was not pretty. It was not a pretty sight, right? Because you, you know, get all, all your testosterone, all your testosterone firing on all cylinders, and then you're arguing about Christianity and Islam. And so we ended up not liking each other. And so Nabil was in here, and I've learned lessons from from those kinds of interactions over time. And I'm with Nabil, and I'm like, you know, I don't want to start arguing and yelling at each other to where we don't get to continue the situation. And I don't want people saying, oh, David Wood's such a jerk. He he uh, he, he went after this Muslim and attacked his faith. And so I prayed and I said, God, uh, if you want me to have a conversation with this guy, please just let him start it. Let him start the conversation. And after that, I'm reading and all of a sudden I hear, so are you a hardcore Christian? And I said, yes, I am. And that was, uh, and that was, that was the start. And over that, uh, over that, that weekend, Nabil told me all about, all about how Islam is proven true by history and science and mathematics and logic and every everything you could you could study you find out that is, Islam is proven true by all of these things and the Bible's been corrupted and Jesus never made the claims that Christians think that he made and he didn't even die on the cross so he didn't rise from the dead and so uh, Nabil took me through everything he believed and at the end of it all I said okay well thank you for uh, explaining what what you believe and you know now I know what you believe uh, but I have a question for you uh, if you're wrong about any of that do, do you want to know it or would you rather go on believing it anyway and that's an important question to ask because I would say I would say about a third because I ask that pretty regularly if someone starts off a conversation that is an important question to me because some people say no usually atheists Usually atheists. I say, okay, so you've told me, you know, you, you don't believe in God because of such and such and such and such, and you know, your grandma died and stuff like that. Um, but if you're wrong about God, would you want to know it? And I've seen a lot of atheists say, no, I would rather go to hell than believe in your God. Now, keep in mind, these are the people who always just go where the evidence points, right? The atheists, they just go where the evidence points. But for some odd reason, they tell me, no, if I was wrong, I wouldn't want to know it. But I asked Nabil this question. Because if someone says no, okay, well fine, let's talk about something else. You've just admitted that if you were wrong, you still wouldn't care. So let's talk about something else, because truth doesn't matter, obviously. But I was talking to Nabil, and Nabil said yes and no. He said, yes, I would want to know the truth about God, but no, because it would, it would destroy my family. And uh, that's those two dual loyalties that were inside of Nabil. That's what I saw battling for the next four years, right? His loyalty to God, he wants to know the truth about God, he wants to do what, what God wants him to do, but he loves his family so much that he, does not, he doesn't want to hurt them. He doesn't want to hurt them. And that, that is tough to watch. See, like my family, I could have walked in and said, Mom, I've decided to become a Martian Buddhist. If it keeps me out of trouble, my mom would be fine with it. It wouldn't matter, right? As long as it's, long as it's keeping me out of trouble. Muslim families, not so much. Different story. Different story there. And uh, it, Nabil had the closest family I'd ever seen in my life. Now, I, I grew up in a West Virginia trailer park, so it's, it's nonstop dysfunction. It's dysfunction in this trailer. It's dysfunction in that trailer. It's dysfunction in the next trailer. No one is normal. Um, and then so sitting there watching Nabil uh, and his family. We went on that first trip. We were gone for two or three days. We came back, and his mom hugged him in the parking lot for 10 minutes. I was thinking my mom didn't hug me for one minute when I got out of prison. What's going on here, right? But that's the relationship that, 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 that Nabil had with his parents, and that's something I had to watch because I'm the one telling him, hey, you, you, you need to follow Jesus. Right? 
We didn't, we didn't end up here in this room together for coincidence. Three possibilities. Either I'm right and you're wrong, or you're right and I'm wrong, or we're both wrong. Can't both be right. So if one of us is right and the other is wrong, we need to take it as a, as a very serious possibility that God has set this up. And that the one who's right is here to show the one who's wrong what's right. And so we, we sort of agreed on that as, as we went on. But at the same time, I have to think, wow, I'm telling this guy every day that he needs to believe in Jesus. And I'm looking at his parents, his awesome parents, and thinking, if this guy ever listens to me, I am ruining this. That is all going to be ruined. That's all going to be horrible. It's going to be a horrible situation. And uh, after four years, um, that did happen. So we spent about the first, I don't know, two and a half years talk, focusing mostly on um, the Bible and the deity of Christ and Jesus' death and resurrection and so on. And then we, we changed somewhere along the lines to focusing uh, mainly on Islamic issues, the reliability of Muhammad, uh, the reliability of the Quran. Talked about that for a while. And... Uh, Eventually, Nabil started getting dreams and visions and so on, telling him to convert, and he did. And then I got to see what, what that did to his family. And, and I've seen that repeated in, in many families over the years. And, and they're, they're, unless it's a totally liberal Muslim family, those do exist. You can be a totally liberal Muslim family where the parents are fine. Uh, one, of, one of those was a guy who sent me a message saying he was going to chop my head off, right? He's a Muslim. He said he's going to chop my head off. And, uh, and then he sent me another message saying he's going to hand me over to Palestinians to let them kill me. And so I messaged him back, well, which one is it? Are you going to chop my head off or are you going to hand me over to Palestinians to kill me? And then I sent him a follow-up message and I said, if you're going to hand me over to Palestinians, is that going to be like over here somewhere? Or do I have to get a plane ticket and fly over there and go over there and then you'll hand me over to them? Which one is it? Because, you know, I'm not understanding what, what you're saying here. And then after, after just a little bit of interacting like that, he said... Uh, he, he, he apologized. He said, I'm sorry. I was just very angry that you, you humiliated our debater. And it was, it, I, I was trying to figure out which debate he was talking about. When I found out, I thought it was one of the debates where I, I was one of my weaker debates, right? I've done about 60 debates with uh, mostly Muslims, but, but some atheists. And I thought this was one of my, one of my weaker debates. And, but he said, I, I made him angry because I humiliated his debater in that debate. And, and I said, hey, you know, I know what you're feeling like right now, because I used to argue with a Christian too when I was an atheist. And he made me really mad. So mad that I ended up doing a lot of stupid things just to try and just to try and win over him. So I understand where you're coming from. I understand that. But once you realize that, hey, you know, this anger's coming from ch being challenged in this way and so on, um, maybe you should look into this a little more. And here's my story. And I sent him, I sent him, a, I sent him a testimony video. Anyway, 10 days later, 10 days later, I get a message and he says, uh, hey, I watched your testimony, and I've been talking to a Christian here, and just want you to know that Jesus is Lord, and uh, I believe in him now, and so on. So he sent me that message, which you can't take entirely seriously at, at that point, right? Because some people will pretend to be Christian for, for one reason or another. But I looked at where he's from. He's from a, a city in India, and I know someone from a city in India, um, like on Facebook. So I sent a message, and I said, hey, uh, I got this message from this guy. He says he lives in your city, and he goes, yeah, I know. I grew up with him. I'm the one who told him to watch your videos. So I've been sending him your videos. And I said, oh, well, he told me he's become a Christian. And he said, yeah, he told me the same thing. I said, can, can you find out? He said, yeah, I'll go ask his mom. And so, uh, so he messages me the next day. Yeah, I asked his mom. He said, uh, he, he told his mom that he's a Christian now. And she said, that's okay, whatever helps him be a good boy. And so anyway, the point of, point of all that was there are families like that where a mom, a Muslim mom can say, okay, you know, he, he's, he's fine. Because they're just thinking, hey, because before he's, I want to chop your head off. Okay, that's a, that's a, that's your, you want your boy to, to, to have a better life than that, right? So she was fine with that. But you, the other re reactions you have from more devout Muslims um, is there are lots of families who will just say, okay, you're gone. Uh, don't ever come back here until you're a Muslim again. We never want to see you again until you're a Muslim. Um, and the other common, the other common response is, well, we're going to take you out. We're going to take you around to a bunch of Muslim scholars and Muslim apologists to show you the right track. Uh, and they'll try to win them back for six months or a year or something. And that's what Nabil's dad did. He started taking him to scholars uh, across the US, over in Europe, and so on. And Nabil would go out there and say, OK, here's 60 pages worth of arguments against Islam that caused me to believe that Islam is false. Let's go through these and explain them. They didn't want to talk to him very much after then. 
And so what's interesting is that after Nabil became a Christian, I thought, cool, I'm done with Islam. Because the only reason I was studying Islam was that my best friend was a Muslim. If he'd been a Mormon, I would have been studying Mormonism. If he'd been a Buddhist, I would have been studying Buddhism. It's a good habit to get into, right? If you have a friend who's something and you want to have conversations with him, it's good to start studying that. So Nabil became a Christian. Cool, I can get back to things that I'm more interested in, which is, you know, philosophical issues and responding to objections of atheists. I was more interested in that. And then it was somewhere along the line, watching the stand that Nabil took. He did his first public debate and absolutely crushed a Muslim imam uh, within a year of his conversion. And just watching what Nabil was going through and the stand he was taking, I realized Muslims make really cool Christians. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. See, we think, you know, unbelievers, they're all, you know, they're prostitutes and drug addicts, and we preach the gospel to them, and their lives are going to get better. A Muslim, you preach the gospel to him, his life's going to get, his life's going to get a lot worse in a lot of ways. And there are these obstacles that are in the way of Muslims, right? One, you've been told all your life that the worst possible sin, the unforgivable sin, is shirk, associating a partner with Allah. So if you say Jesus is Lord, you've just committed the worst possible sin in Islam. So they're told that all their lives. Um, two, they understand that they will have to likely give up their families. And if not completely give up their families, the relationship is going to be very strained forever. But it's not going to be the happy relationship that you once had. And not just your immediate you know, mom, mom and dad, cousins, aunts, uncles, that becomes a very, those relationships all become very painful now, if you're not completely shunned. And three, Muhammad commanded, if anyone leaves his Islamic religion, kill him. It's not carried out. It's not carried out generally in the United States and, and Western nations, but you always have to wonder, is someone ever going to actually carry out the Islamic penalty and chop my head off? Because that's what, that's what Muhammad said. Is anyone ever going to say, no, we're not doing it, but this is what Muhammad said to do. So we preach the gospel. Jesus loves you. Trust in Jesus. Died on the cross for your sins. The Muslim is hearing, okay, believe this thing that is the worst possible sin and the one-way ticket to hell. And on top of that, I'm going to have to give up my family in this life, and then someone may chop my head off for it. You guys call that the good news? That's the good news? Because it sounds like the worst news ever, people. But there's a, there's a flip side, and the flip side is, once a person has said, you know, I've been told all my life that this will get me sent to hell, and I may have to give up my entire family, and I may get beheaded over this, but I don't care because I want to know Jesus. That's someone who will lay down his life for Christ. And that's why Muslims make really awesome Christians. And so it was along that way watching the Beal when I realized, you know, there are tons of Christian apologists who deal with atheism. And Muslims make up 1.6 billion people in the world, over a fifth of the world's population. And almost no one touches it. Almost no one touches it. And so maybe I should be doing what's needed and not what I feel like doing. So I started focusing on, on Islam. And along the way, I realized, um, hey, I don't have to reluctantly do this. But I think we are actually in the best time in history for reaching Muslims. I mean, for, 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 for most of history, you had basically Muslims over here and Christians over here. Not a lot of interaction. If you wanted to go to the Middle East to preach the Muslims, you had a pretty good chance of getting your head chopped off. If you were, started being successful and people were converting, you're going to get your head chopped off. Uh, so it's only very recently that all of a sudden we have lots of Muslims in the United States. You can walk out and, and, and uh, you can walk out and talk to a Muslim today if you want. Uh, but even more so, uh, technology, right? Anyone in this room can pull out a phone out of their pocket and talk to a Muslim in Saudi Arabia right now if you wanted to. For 14 centuries, Muslim leaders have been able to keep people insulated from hearing any criticisms of Islam and from hearing alternatives to Islam. And now, now you can reach Muslims in any country in the world that has an internet connection without getting your head chopped off. So we are actually in the best time in history for people who want to reach Muslims with the gospel. 14 centuries of Christians couldn't have dreamed of these kinds of opportunities that, that we have right now. And so, uh, so at first I was kind of reluctantly studying Islam, uh, but now I think that we're, we're here in one of the best times in all of history. And I believe, I believe that we're going to see more Muslims come to Christ in our lifetimes than all prior generations combined have seen. Because I believe uh, that's what we're here for this purpose and that we've been assigned this purpose. So, so, there we go. Thank you.
You have to be reading your Bible. I can't tell you. I always say this. I don't know how it changes us. It just does. The sickness, the the, the tragedy, the death, the, the hit on drugs, the whatever. God wants to use, well, where did God come from? And if he created us, who created him. And how is that we tend to look at every battle and every problem in this natural realm. Like what I see, I see, you know, but see, we don't get it here. Because we think Jesus asking him in our life just means, uh, I get to go to heaven.